A good day to you all. I am Dr. Vinay. Today we will be discussing a module, module number 5, Posture and Equilibrium. So posture and equilibrium involve maintaining a balance against all the external forces of the body and the ability to maintain the orientation of the body parts with respect to each other and also with respect to the external environment. This allows us to perform various motor functions. So today we will be discussing posture and equilibrium by discussing it under two subheadings postural balance and postural equilibrium. After this, we will study the biomechanical requirements of maintaining a postural equilibrium and a postural orientation. Then we will understand that posture is a sensory motor process. So there are sensory components involved to sense the position of the body in space and then motor components involved to maintain a specific posture. And then finally, we will briefly discuss some certain abnormalities of posture too. Now if we see the human body. The human body is a multi-segmented articulated body. As you can see, the, uh, the human body has a musculoskeletal system. We have certain joints. Each of these joints have muscles extending across it and is formed by articulating bones. So these joints can be manipulated into different positions based on the muscular activity and the bony interactions at across these joints. So postural equilibrium involves maintaining a specific body posture by controlling the muscular activity and bony position across multiple joints. Now if we see the human body, the human body is under a set of constraints. There are external constraints placed on us in terms of the external forces acting on us. So on earth the most common external force is gravity. So gravity acts in a vertically downward direction. And similarly we are also uh, under the subject of reaction forces with all the surfaces we are in touch with. So for example if I were to place my hands on this table, this table is exerting a reaction force against my hand. And similarly there are also a set of internal constraints placed on the body. So as you can see my hands have multiple segments, there is an arm, there is a forearm and there is this wrist. Each of these joints have a particular range of motions and uh, there is a limited amount of postures I can obtain because of the, the length of the bones involved and the range of motion of the joints across various planes. Now coming to postural equilibrium and orientation. So the, po the posture and equilibrium has two distinct objectives. One is a postural equilibrium which is the ability to maintain a steady position irrespective of the external forces acting on it. So the external forces acting on a body can be translational as in they can displace us in a linear way or they can be rotational. Our ability to maintain a constant posture even though these forces are acting on us is a key motor requirement. And then there is the postural orientation. So postural orientation basically represents a, a, a balance between the various forces acting on us and then achieving a specific orientation. So it can be an internal orientation as in if I am standing my, my trunk is above my legs, my legs are all extended and my hands could be extended too. And then I can also maintain an external orientation with respect to the world around me. Now if we see the biomechanical requirements of posture. Now there is a little bit of elementary physics which comes in here. So the entire body can be represented by a center of mass. So the center of mass is taken to be a central point of the body around which all the moments of mass are considered to be equal. So if we have to consider the body in the supine position or in the standing position, the center of mass is located in the abdomen somewhere around the second lumbar vertebra around 2 to 3 centimeters ahead of the vertebral column. So the another center of mass which is representative of body has to be maintained at a particular position. So for example, if I were standing on two legs like this or if a dog were to be standing on four legs like this. As you can see, we are, we are forming points of contact with our external environment. So a dog which is standing on four legs would be standing somewhat like this, see? four points of contact, one, two, three and four. So each of these four points of contacts form a support base. So now the center of mass must overlie the support base to be stable. If the center of mass were to be away from the support base, then the body would be imbalanced and tend to fall forward. Now one of the basics behind equilibrium is, now the equilibrium of a center of mass suspended or a support base, the stability of such an equilibrium would depend on two factors. One thing would be how wide the support base would be. So for example, if we were to be supine, our entire dorsum of the body would form a point of contact as opposed to a position like this in which only my only my bottom surface forms a point of contact. 
So greater the support area base, greater the stability. Then the second factor which affects the stability is the actual height of the center of mass above the support base. So for example, if you were to be standing on your two feet like this, your center of mass in your abdomen would be at around a height of around a meter away from the support base formed by your feet. So because, of, uh, because the center of mass is being placed at such a height, there is a tendency for the center of mass to sway due to various activities like breathing, movement of hands. So this contributes to the instability in that position. So uh, the supine position is the most stable position, it does not require active postural control. Whereas if you are to be standing, the center of mass would have to be actively maintained at a height, at such a height. And also the tendency of the center of mass to sway at that points would be obtained, would have to be countered. So as you can see, the upright stance is one of the most common functional postures. So for this, if you'll observe, we are standing on a two legs. Now our legs have joints like the hip joint, the knee joint, and the ankle joint. Now, if the muscles across these joints weren't contracting, there could be a tendency of these joints to collapse under the weight of the body. Now, human beings luckily have the axis, long axis of these bones is aligned to the gravitational vector. So, the upright stance can be maintained with minimal postural contribution from the limb muscles. Whereas, if we have to maintain our back erect and our neck erect, we would need to contract the erector spinae muscle for the back, the extensors of the neck for us to be able to maintain this steady extended posture. Now, whereas if you study animals, so dogs, cats which have quadrupedal locomotion now their hip bones and knee bones and leg bones are not aligned to the gravitational vector so in such animals an active extension activity would have to be developed across these joints in order to maintain the standing posture so postural muscles are considered by uh, postural muscles are considered to have a constant steady tone throughout the posture uh, maintenance of posture now, postural muscles are resistant to fatigue. This is because of the fiber composition. Now, if you study muscle fibers, they have two types. They are type 1 fibers and type 2 fibers. Type 1 fibers are considered to be slow twitch fibers. So, these are red in color. They have a good, good amount of mitochondria and are well supplied by capillaries. And they are capable of maintaining a tonic contraction and they are fatigue resistant as opposed to type 2 muscles which are fast twitch white fibers. Now maintenance of muscle tone is one of the key components of postural control. Now if you see a skeletal muscle, a skeletal muscle is considered of, consists of many muscle fibers. The muscle fibers can be classified into two fibers, extrafusal fibers or intrafusal fibers. So fusiform refers to a spindle, right? So the intrafusal fibers form a sensory organ called the muscle spindle. Now the role of the muscle spindle is to measure and sense the length of the muscle and also the tone in the muscle. So the muscle spindle plays a key role in a, in a uh, primitive postural reflex called the stretch reflex. So the stretch reflex is the most basic of postural reflexes. So as you know any reflex consists of a sensory component and, an in, and a motor component and a central component. So the sensory component arises from the intrafusal fibers in the muscle. So the sensory neuron which arises from this intrafusal fibers in the muscle spindle is a 1A neuron. We call them 1A afferents. These are large diameter neurons which have high conduction velocities. Now these sensory neurons synapse at the spinal level corresponding to wherever the muscle is. And the synapse sound an alpha motor neuron. The alpha motor neuron goes and supplies the extrafusal fibers to the same muscle and thereby can cause contraction. So activation of the 1A afferents by stretch of the muscle. There are mechanoreceptors present in this uh, muscle spindle and the intrafusal fibers. They cause the firing of the afferent neuron and this can excite the alpha motor neuron which can lead to a contraction. So any stimulus which would passively stretch the muscle. Like for example a tendon jerk in which we, we strike the tendon of a muscle with a, a knee hammer or something stretching the muscle would be accompanied by the muscle contracting. Now in addition to the alpha motor neuron, there is a second type of neuron called a gamma motor neuron. So what a gamma motor neuron does is, it innervates the ends of the intrafusal fibers. Now the intrafusal fibers are not contractile throughout as opposed to the extrafusal fibers, but the, if you see the ends of the intrafusal fibers, these are contractile. So shortening of the intrafusal fiber by stimulation of gamma uh, motor neuron 
would would adjust the sensitivity of this thing so by regulating the alpha motor activity and the gamma motor activity the tone of the muscle could be regulated as a whole so similar to the stretch reflex which is integrated at the spinal level there are also a group of reflexes which are integrated at supraspinal levels too for example the labyrinthine reaction the stepping reaction now the stepping reaction is a reflex in which if a body is suspended above and let's say i'm being suspended above like this and my feet is you know just touching the ground so what would happen is my feet would be uh, would tend to collapse into plantar flexion thereby bringing me in contact with the ground which allows me to support my weight so that's a supporting reaction similarly postural reflexes can be integrated at much uh, higher levels like the brain stem and the cerebral cortex too now in addition to the common postural reflexes there are a group of responses which are more complex in nature which involves the integration across multiple neural centers and these are called postural responses so any postural response is basically a restorative force which seeks to generate balance now for example if you were to be standing like this on the ground you are standing like this right and for some reason let's say you are standing in a bus like this and this bus is suddenly accelerating forward or the bus is suddenly decelerating forward or suddenly decelerating then what would happen is inertia would uh, would make your body to tend to stay in space whereas the flow below your feet is getting displaced so for example let's say i'm in a decelerating bus right now because of inertia i tend to swing forward and this swinging forward takes place at my ankle joint so right now my center of mass is being displaced forward over the support base formed by my feet So now what would happen is there would be a contraction in the plantar flexors of my ankle which are like this so right now if i'm swimming swimming forward this is my contact base i'm swinging forward now what would happen is there would be a contraction here pulling my body back or the supporting base so as you can see any postural response is a restorative force now and restorative forces are developed in the muscles which can basically bring us back to stability so based on the requirement any muscle could elicit a postural response based on the biomechanical requirements of the equilibrium so as you can see we our body can dis get displaced along any directions so each of these muscles are basically arranged in such a way their attach attachments their origins and their attachments are in such a way that they can restore the body in specific directions so for example if my body were to swing forward the plantar flexors of my ankle would swing it backwards so any any displacement which would tend to swing me forward would recruit a postural response from my muscle which would swing me backwards so you can say my plantar flexors are tuned such that they are more maximally recruited in in uh, postural displacements which swing me forward so similarly we have muscles which are tuned for different directions so for example when are we have to de de generate a restorative force which has to bring us back in a, in, a, in by generating a movement across multiple planes so we recruit a group of muscles through a complex pattern of activation we call this a muscle synergy which is basically a, a pattern of activation across groups of muscles which will generate the requisite restoring force to bring us back to balance so muscle synergies are basically motor strategies these are integrated at the supraspinal levels so any postural displacement would basically recruit a muscle synergy which would bring us back to equilibrium right now if you see the postural equilibrium it, it uh, the requirements of a postural equilibrium can be of two types it can be either steady postural equilibrium in which the center of mass is kept in a steady position contracting any external translational or rotational forces acting on it or it can also be a dynamic equilibrium for example while we are walking we need a center of mass to take a steady line as opposed to wavering around the support base so the center of mass needs to be displaced in a, in a steady specific manner contracting any disturbing influences which would cause it to deviate from the required tra trajectory so performance of motor tasks requires steady equilibrium sometimes and also it requires dynamic equilibrium so sometimes if i were to move my hand for example my hand needs a steady framework which means my body should be steady so for example if i'm contracting my hand like this for my elbow to move forward my proximal segment which in this case is my arm would have to be studied 
so that a contraction in the biceps muscles would move a hand forwards so performance of more performance of voluntary motion any volitional activities is also accompanied by the requisite postural responses which allow us to stabilize the body posture enabling us to perform that task so now uh, now that we have discussed the biomechanical requirements behind such a postural control now if we see the strategies involved at the neural level so first thing is we need to sense our position in the body so we sense our position of various segments in the body and we also need to sense our position with respect to space so there are sensory components involved in posture and once this uh, sensory integration takes place so if you see in our sensory systems there are three primary systems which are responsible for sensing in posture the first one is the somatosensory system which is involved in proprioception so proprioception is basically knowledge about the self and then there's the vestibular system which is housed in the otolith organs of the inner ear and then there's a the visual system so if you see a somatosensory system now the somatosensory system consists of mechanoreceptors distributed all across the body so this is, mechanoreceptors are present in the skin they are present in the muscle they are present in the tendon they are present in joint spaces now what this allow what they do is they basically allow us sensing so for example muscle spindle as we discussed earlier allows us to do the muscle tension and muscle tone and similarly if we see joint receptors they allow us to know the joint position the range of movement across the joint and what position is the joint actually stabilized in similarly tendon uh, tendon receptors and connective tissue mechanoreceptors allow us to measure the passive stresses and active stresses acting along them so if we see somatosensory uh, information is is basically integrated at the levels of the central nervous system to give us a complete internal model of the body so what an internal model of the body does is it gives us a neural representation of a orientation of our body segments with respect to each other so if you see the efferents of the uh, proprioceptors these are basically one ear efferents and these go through a column called this dorsal column in the spinal cord and they go to the higher postural centers in the brain stem and the cerebral cortex uh, coming to the vestibular system so the inner ear consists of the vestibular system the vestibular system can, uh, and the inner, and the cochlea the cochlea is involved in audition now coming to the vestibular system the vestibular system has to uh, has otolith organs namely the utricle the sacule and the semicircular canals if you see the utricle and sacule they are sensitive to linear acceleration so basically acceleration in a linear direction which can either be horizontal or which can be vertical so the sacule is sensitive to vertical uh, acceleration and the utricle is sensitive to horizontal act acceleration now if you see these receptors within this otolith organs these are hair cells so basically what happens is this otolith organs have hair cells and they also have endolymph so when our endo when our acceleration takes place the endolymph is displaced and this hair cells bend so this can be studied in greater detail in the transduction at hair cells which is a separate module by itself so basically uh, when other hair cells are displaced they are depolarized and lead to the generation of an action potential now similarly we have three semicircular canals in each inner ear now each of the semicircular canals are arranged in such a way that they can sense three degrees of freedom in rotation so there's a semicircular canal in the horizontal plane which is sensitive to uh, accelerations and rotations in this plane there's a semicircular canal in the uh, in the vertical plane which is sensitive to displacements and accelerations in that plane and similarly there's a semicircular canal in a perpendicular plane these are all mutually perpendicular to you so that they can all cover all potential degrees of freedom of rotation then coming to the visual system so the visual system is what allows us information about the external world so uh, we need to uh, when we are walking for example we are walking on rough terrain the visual system basically encodes the external space around us it gives us prior warning about any potential obstacles around us and any potential destabilizing scenarios and thereby allowing us to take the appropriate corrective responses now you see any of these three systems by themselves they are inadequate to give us complete information so for example if you see the somatosensory system the somatosensory system allows us to construct internal models but it doesn't give us any information about the external agents acting on the body the external world around around us now for example the somatosensory system can measure muscle tone now muscle tone could be generated by voluntary activity or also by externally stretching the muscle 
the somato sensory muscle uh, system wouldn't be able to distinguish between these two similarly we see the vestibular system now linear acceleration now, if even if just my head were to be tilting forward or if my entire body is accelerating come uh, at the same rate the vestibular system would be unable to distinguish this similarly if you see the visual system the visual system can be fooled sometimes for example if you have ever been sitting in a train or a bus and suddenly you can see a bus or a train on the opposite platform moving out basically what's happening is your entire visual scene is moving this can lead to an illusion that you yourself are moving so this is called vexion so as we can see there are limitations involved in the percepts and the models generated by any single system so basically what happens is a process of sensory integration in which information from the somatosensory information from the visual and information from the vestibular system all of these three are brought together and integrated so integration takes place at the levels of the medulla and the pons in the vestibular nuclei and this is then then forward uh, process to give us a model of the body both internally and externally and this information is fed forward to the motor systems of postural control for generation of various postural responses now sensory integration allows us to construct internal models of the body one more thing it allows us to do is to construct a frame of reference so whenever we are in the external world we orient ourselves according to a particular frame of reference now the one of the most common frames of references we use is the gravitational vertical as in what counts as the downward direction so for example we have proprioceptors in our abdomen which are stimulated by the weight of the abdominal organs acting on them then we have the sacul which is also stimulated by the uh, endolymph being acted upon by the gravity stimulating the um, stimulating the hair cells in the hair in the sacul so this allows us to construct a specific frame of reference centered around the gravitational vertical but let's say we are in an environment in which we are actually dependent on visual cues to determine what is up and what is down so there's a gravitational vertical and there's a visual vertical now usually both of these systems are connected together to in such a way that the gravitational vertical is coincident with the visual vertical but sometimes if you are in an environment in which the visual scene is inclined for some reason then in such a case we would have we would have to perform activities with respect to the visual vertical even though it doesn't correspond to the gravitational vertical so each of these frames of references have to be basically constructed at the supraspinal level and if we see sensory integration it's a weighted integration as in weightage is given to the appropriate sensory modality based on how relevant it is in the current scenario so for example if you are working working on plain ground then visual information is considered to be reliable but let's say if you are working in the dark then visual information is no longer available and we are dependent on proprioceptive and gravitational information and uh, vestibular information to sense the gravitational ver vertical so sensory integration is a dynamic process in which sensory inputs are weighted according to the relevance in the current scenario to give us a complete and appropriate internal and external model and allows us to construct a frame of reference to perform the various functional activities now if you see the actual motor components involved in postural control so motor motor control of posture is distributed hierarchically across multiple centers it it starts at the spinal cord brain stem then there are also the bra 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 the basal ganglia and the cerebellum and also cere cerebral cortex so motor planning is an integrated process which involves recruitment of all these areas to generate the appropriate motor activity now one way of studying the individual contribution of each of this each of the centers is through neural lesioning studies so studies have been performed by transection of the cranial axis in which just the spinal cord was isolated just the brain stem and spinal cord were isolated then lesioning studies were done by by targeting focal lesions at the basal ganglia level focal lesions at the cerebellum level focal lesions at various cerebral uh, motor cortices to see the individual contribution to each of this so one of the, the experimental preparations were done so to study spinal integration level integration for example an experimental preparation called the spinal organism was produced so what is done is if you see the cranial neuraxis starting from the brain to the spinal cord it can be transected so let's say if you wanted to study the lower limb postural control a transection can be performed at the level of the thoracic spinal cord 
and this basically we have a spinal animal now with only a functional spinal cord below the thoracic level so then we, we try to see what are the various responses a spinal animal is capable of so it was found that a spinal animal is actually capable of maintaining an upright stance because of residual uh, tone in the in the activity and passive bone to bone forces but what was found to be lacking was the spinal animal was in incapable of uh, maintaining postural balance as in even though it was maintaining an upright stance this upright stance was very unstable the spinal animal tended to sway about it and any displacement swaying it beyond a particular point would cause it to collapse because of its inability to maintain balance and similarly spinal animals were also found to form stepping responses like if they are uh, suspended above a treadmill with just their feet touching the treadmill they are found to take steps forward and backwards in a walking like motion so this basically shows us that the spinal cord possesses the basic circuitry to maintain upright stance and also to generate the stepping motion required for locomotion but what it lacks is a sensory motor transformation as in to sense the various imbalances caused and then transform it into an appropriate postural response which generates balance so for this for sensory motor transformations for required for postural control were thus proved to be taking place at a higher level than the spine now coming to the brain stem so the brain stem consists of the midbrain the pons and the medulla so if you see each of these contain very critical motor regions for example the brain stem contains various motor uh, motor nuclei like the vestibular nuclei which has involved in sensory motor transformation the pontine and the medullary reticular formation and the red nucleus in addition to this there are also multiple cranial nuclei also cranial nerve nuclei also present at the level of the brain stem now we we remember we discussed postural synergies A postural synergy represents the pattern of activation in a group of muscles capable of uh, recruiting a specific postural response which is directionally tuned so postural synergic strategies were found to be neurally represented at the brain stem levels now if we see motor control we also discussed alpha and gamma motor neurons at the level of the spinal cord which innervate muscles now each of this alpha and gamma motor neurons are innervated by spinal cord descending tracts so descending motor tracts are tracts arising from the brain stem tracts arising from the cerebral cortex and these project on to the various alpha motor neurons at various spinal levels so the descending motor tracts can be classified into two they are the medial descending motor tracts and the lateral descending motor tracts now the medial descending motor tracts are the tracts which have been uh, found to be involved in postural control we have two major medial descending motor tracts one is the reticulospinal tract the second one is the vestibulospinal tract the vestibulospinal tract arises from the vestibular nucleus and projects onto the extensor muscles of the upper limb and the lower limb now the reticulospinal tract can be divided into two parts the pontine reticulospinal tract and the medullary reticulospinal tract so the pontine reticulospinal tract is excitatory the medullary reticulospinal tract is inhibitory so each of the, these also project onto the extensor muscles and the of the upper limb and the lower limb so now if you see the pontine reticular formation it projects to various cerebral cortex centers and also receives projects projections from them whereas the vestibular vestibular centers receive sensory inputs from the somatosensory the visual and the vestibular systems and then also project onto the extensor muscles of the lower limb and the upper limb now coming to the lateral descending tracts the lateral descending tracts are the rubrospinal tract and the corticospinal tract so the rubrospinal tract arises from the red nucleus and it predominantly supplies the flexor muscles of the upper arm and the corticospinal tract arises from the motor cortex goes through the internal capsule forms the pyramidal tract also which is also the other name of the corticospinal tract and projects onto the various muscles up both flexors and extensors and is responsible for performing voluntary motions and fine motor control so briefly the uh, the medial descending tracts are extensor in nature and they are involved in postural control whereas the lateral descending tracts involve the flexor muscles predominantly are and are involved in fine motor control for the performance of voluntary activities now the cerebellum basal ganglia and cerebral cortex work in an integrated way in uh, they are involved in motor planning for the generation of uh, volitional movement 
and also the anticipatory postural responses. So if you see motor planning, motor planning is basically starts with the conception of performing an activity and then basically recruitment of the various muscles required to perform such an activity. So this involves the higher order motor cortices like the primary motor cortex, the supplementary motor cortex and it, it works in coordination along with the basal ganglia which are a group of brainstem which are a group of subcortical nuclei and also the cerebellum. So we can study each of these three things in individual detail. Now if you see the motor cortices, the motor cortices contains a, a representation, a, a somatotropic representation of the various muscles of the body across the gyri. And it coordinates with the supplementary motor cortices to generate a motor plan. Now the motor plan is transmitted to the muscles to perform the activity and similarly a copy of the motor plan is also sent to the sensory centers which receive proprioceptive information from these muscles. So now basically what happens is uh, the, mo the motion is executed and the proprioceptors at the levels of the muscle can actually sense the motion executed by these muscles and, is, and the relative position of the body is also sensed and sent back to the sensory centers and what is happening is the sensory information coming from the periphery is matched with uh, the copy of the motor plan being sent to it from the motor centers. Now what is happened is what happens is we detect if there is an area error between what was supposed to happen as which is suggested by the motor plan and what is actually happening which is being sensed by the sensory muscles and this allows us to modify the output in the subsequent cycles accordingly. Now if you see the basal ganglia, the basal ganglia are a group of subcortical nuclei. So they are involved in uh, circuits involving the cortex, the thalamus and the basal ganglia. So they are cortico basal, cortico basal ganglia, thalami, thalamo cortical circuits. So CTBG, so that is a short form of calling it that way. You can remember it that way. So these circuits are involved in motor planning. Now similarly what the basal ganglia also do during posture is they adjust the gain and sensitivity of the postural responses as in how much of a response should I develop for this much of displacement. So any postural response must be graded as in it must be of an appropriate amplitude to restore the body back to normal. If the postural response is too, is too strong then it will displace the body in the opposite direction again destabilizing it. So grading of the amplitude, grading of the tone of the postural response is important and the basal ganglia and the cerebellum play a key role in adjusting the gain of the postural responses. The spinocerebellum receives inputs from the spinocerebellar tracts and is involved in grading the response of the postural, of the postural response along with the basal ganglia. Now the cerebrocerebellum or the lateral cerebellum is involved in motor learning and motor planning. So lesions of the uh, cerebral cerebellum have been found to cause incoordination in motor movements. So now if we see the various postural strategies uh, adopted. So postural strategy, strategies can be broadly classified into two kinds. One is basically a responsive kind in which we are actually responding to a disturbance caused by an external agent. So the disturbances caused by the external agent are sensed by the three somatosensory three sensory systems: the somatosensory system, the visual system, and the vestibular system. And then a uh, uh, motor strategy is formulated at the level of the brainstem and is acted upon by the higher centers like the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the basal ganglia. And then the appropriate motor response is mounted. Now the second strategy is a feed-forward kind of strategy. In this what we are doing is we are intrinsically generating a moment, we are anticipating the potential displacements and imbalances caused by a moment. So for example uh, if I have to move this hand, I have to instinctively stabilize all the body, all the other body parts allowing me to generate a rigid framework allowing me to perform this moments. So postural control acts both in a static way and in a dynamic way through the process of sensory motor transformations and motor planning. Now if you see the abnormalities caused due to, uh, due to abnormalities in the postural system. So the postural system is a sensory motor system. So any diseases affecting any component either in the sensing part or the motor part could lead to postural abnormalities. So for example if you have to consider sensory ataxia. 
so sensory ataxia is usually caused by diseases affecting the somatosensory system so as we discussed earlier the somatosensory system has large diameter efferents which could be affected in some kinds of peripheral neuropathy some kinds of tertiary syphilis so basically what happens is the somatosensory information is no longer reaching the brain stem centers for integration so as we discussed sensory integration is required for generation of a complete model and for so generation of the appropriate postural response so if you see in cases of sensory ataxia we are dependent on a visual and vestibular systems so for example if we were to deprive ourselves of visual information by keeping our eyes shut then our body would tend to sway uncontrollably because the somatosensory system is also damaged and the vestibular system would be the only one contributing sensory information so we call this the romberg sign basically the inability to maintain steady standing posture with your eyes closed in patients with somatosensory ataxia then we can also consider vestibular ataxia Now if you see the vestibular system we receive contributions from both sides from both ears now for some reason if one vestibule was damaged then there would be an imbalance in inputs reaching the brain stem centers so this is associated with the sensation of dizziness and rotation as though the body were to be rotating in uncontrollably so if both vestibules were to be damaged then it's not associated with the ataxia because there's no more any imbalance so basically imbalance between inputs arising from both sides of the body would lead to a sensation of vertigo then coming to cerebellar ataxia so cerebellar ataxia is is associated with certain signs there is hypotonia then there is inability to control the amplitude of the responses so the body uh, so uh, uh, intentional activity cannot be brought to a sudden controlled movement so the body the body tends to produce movements which are oscillatory rather than producing sharp controlled movements and then there is also an ability to perform rapidly alternating movements because of our ability to terminate movements and basically this is called past pointing and this shadow co kinesia uh, abnormal posturing responses so abnormal posturing responses are abnormal body postures which are produced due to lesions at the level of the cranial neuraxis so that two common abnormal posturing responses decerebrate rigidity and decorticate rigidity so decerebrate rigidity is also called extensor hyperrigidity in which the body goes into a extended posture with both the upper limbs and the lower limbs and the back held in a sustained position of extension now this is because of a lesion at the level of the mid collicular level in the mid brain so what's happening is the brain stem nuclei below the mid collicular level in this case the vestibular vestibular nuclei and the pontine and medullary reticular formation are being liberated from the inhibited inhibitory influences from the higher cortical centers so this leads to an uncontrolled activity in the reticulospinal and vestibulospinal tracts leading to extension in the upper limbs and the lower limbs now decorticate rigidity is also called flexor rigidity in this the lesion is higher than the mid colic level and it's a level it's a lesion in the level of the cerebral cortex now in addition to the uncontrolled activity of the vestibulospinal tract and the reticulospinal tract the red nucleus is also liberated from higher control so this leads to a flexion in the upper limbs due to an increased activity in the rubrospinal tract so abnormal postures are usually associated with brain trauma and are associated with a very poor prognosis so quickly summarizing what posture and equilibrium is all about so posture and equilibrium is a distinct sensory motor process we use the somatosensory visual and vestibular systems to derive information about the self and also the environment around us allowing us to construct a specific frame of reference and internal models uh, internal models of the body and external models of the environment around us and involves a synergistic activation of muscles through neural centers present in the spinal cord brain stem basal ganglia cerebellum and cerebral cortex